See, this is the real secret of life, to be completely engaged with the here and now. Welcome to the Human Derek Podcast, connecting you with the seven fundamentals of life that will take you to the next level. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself. It, 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 it was all a dream. Today is about the power of you. You've now entered the Human Derek Podcast. Hello. All right. <laughs> What's up? Make sure I'm going to grab another poster. Is it not letting you unmute yourself? There we go. No, I just didn't unmute myself. How are you? <laughs> hey, pretty great. How are you? You got quite a, you got the, you know, what? the blurry background thing. I like that. That looks pretty cool. It keeps the focus on the, uh, focus on the face. Focus on the face. Yeah. Focus on that face. That beautiful Fassbender, Fassbender. You know, I kind of go back and forth, Matt. I'm like, Fassbender, Fassbender. It's got to be Fassbender, though, right? Is it? Say it again. I just, I, I just was turning on the light in here to see if I could get some better lighting. Oh, cool. Uh, I was saying uh, last name. I was like, sometimes I say Fassbender, but I know it's like Fassbender. I kind of go back and forth in my mind. Fassbender, right? I said, right, it's Fassbender. Beautiful Fassbender face. That strong family heritage. <laughs> I'm going to make sure my phone's on uh, airplane mode here. Sweet deal. So I don't get any peeings, man. How are you? Real good. How's things out in um, beautiful Southern California? I saw that picture you sent me this morning. <laughs> were, you, were you running on the beach? I, uh, I took some kettlebells out there. Um, I think the hardest part of the workout was carrying the kettlebells from the car to the sand, actually. But uh, yeah, it's... Uh, so fun. So I was, there's a beach, not there's, I mean, there's a ton of beaches around here, but yeah, Pacific beach. So I took some kettlebells out and threw on the headphones and just feels like a, it's a great way to, to start the day, man. A little bit of nat, uh, nature, almost a nature, nature. I'm not a speak English. <laughs> and, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Do you, do you have any, uh, like routines, like stuff you do to, to start your day? Well, um, I don't know if I told you, but we, so we were living in Florida for a while and, and then we moved back to Wisconsin and, uh, we bought a 30 acre old dairy farm and we've been restoring it for like the last two years. So, uh, my morning routine now is, uh, we have small livestock, sheep, goats, chickens, and we just got a dog. So it's taking care of that. <laughs> that that's my morning routine now, but it's, it's, I love it. The kids love it. The wife loves it. And then that's our evening routine too. Man, that is, um, that's incredible. I think the, you know, people talk about like, oh, you got to work out or you got to meditate. Well, maybe, but something yeah. that sounds like a pretty beautiful routine. Like maybe the, the, your version of meditation or prayer, or whatever it might be, is just working with the farm. Can you say 30 acres? Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I used to be a diehard, you know, workout. Um, and I still really enjoy it. I, I, there's nothing better than getting like a runner's high and just going on, you know, running through here. We don't have beaches. Well, we do at Lake Michigan, but you know, you run, you run through like a state park, Coney park, and, uh, there's nothing better than that, but I kind of like switched it now for, um, we did it for just like family, family formation, we have four kids. So, we wanted them to be able to connect in this digital era, like with real life things. So um, it's, you know, it's different for kids growing up now versus, uh, you know, when we grew up when, uh, I don't know, I didn't have a cell phone until I was a senior in, in college. So um, we just kind of like made that decision based off of that wow. to, to start, you know, farm life. And you know, I think that's awesome. I'm Love to have some chickens and, you know, you, you said goats, right? You have goats. Yeah. So we have, um, we started with actually, um, chickens and then we got goats cause they're just real, they're real practical, um, easy, easy to move. Um, they eat anything, uh, they could just forage and you don't really have to buy any food for them except for in, in the winter time, they, they need, you know, grain and hay. 
But um, we started with that and then we got sheep and we just, we've been observing the differences between sheep and goats. Uh, you can't have uh, sheep at a petting zoo that they, they're very sheepish and uh, goats. I mean, they'll, <laughs> they'll run up to you and just stampede you for, for anything. So uh, yeah, it's uh, the kids love it. And Sunday uh, our, one of our sheep had three lambs. So that was a, it was an exciting uh, Sunday for the kids and everybody on our little farm. That's pretty cool, man. A beautiful lambs on a Sunday. I mean, that seems uh, like, uh, I don't believe in coincidences, but that's very magical. We can call yeah. it that's pretty sweet. You, by the way, I, uh, it's already recording. I, I hope I, I think I shared that with you. Like I just start recording and it jumps right into it. So I think I definitely put it in the email. So I hope it wasn't a surprise or anything cool. Then, uh, cause there's like an editing process and okay. kind of that stuff. So, yeah, but, uh, do, I guess, you know, do you have any questions about anything? Cause I know we didn't really talk about, it's like, Hey, let's just do this thing. And, you know, very <laughs> conversational, but any specific questions? Well, I, I got on your, basically your website, your platform that you're launching, um, or have launched. Uh, so, you know, what kind of audiences are you targeting? Oh yeah. And I'm not, <clears throat> I guess. I'm not doing it like in the traditional, it's okay. not like, oh man, let's go build a million dollar business with this. Or I okay. want to, uh, just really having fun with it. And so awesome. the, the sixth episode of recording, now that there's, there'll be six of them, probably yeah. look at like actually publishing them next week. But I mean, it, it's really just about, you know, kind of like what we're already talking about. That's a, uh, what I have found people really enjoy, what I enjoy doing, having conversations, kind of digging into stuff, especially when it comes to business. A lot of those things translate to, to life. I could share with you to, to give you an idea, I guess, a, a feeling of it. Yeah. You know, let's do this. I'll share the, uh, the intro music with you. And uh, let's see. Can, I wonder if I can play this through the... Uh, let me see if I can figure out a way to play this through the the speaker can you hear that okay yeah yeah i can hear it good i'm just gonna play it then keep it engaged welcome to the human terrain podcast connecting you with fundamentals of life that will take you to the next level everybody wants to fulfill the highest truest expression of yourself how's that feel i like it yeah <laughs> there you go that's uh just having some fun with it uh so yeah cool well then uh, any other questions i guess um so just your basically format is just a conversation right yeah um, there's Absolutely. no plans Normal, authentic, nice. real people. Uh, I mean, even you talking about goats and stuff, there's like a million different things. Maybe not a million, but there's a few things that pop into my mind, you know, especially since coffee's probably on the agenda. Yeah. At some point today. Check this out, actually. I just picked this up, which is kind of cool. Have you ever World seen World Atlas of Coffee. That's awesome. It, I, I, I have, have that. a few other coffee books, and there's one called maybe it's called the epic of coffee uh or the epic of coffee like the commodity of coffee and it talks it's a the and i'm only in chapter one of it i just started actually i put on audible i'm like i'm talking to brad i gotta you know I'm, i want to like pick up some more coffee facts and yeah are you familiar with that one the epic of coffee or the it, it starts off with a goat story actually um, well, yeah, the origin of coffee, I'm familiar with not that specific book title and maybe it's been referenced at some point, but I, I don't remember it. Well, and that's the, the funny thing about, I think about origin story. So I want to hear, I want to hear your origin story because sometimes, I mean, like think about the creation of the world. If you talk to, you know, an, an Inuit in Alaska, and then you talk to someone from the Navajo tribe and then you talk to someone in Italy or Florida or California, you might, each one of them might have very distinct and different origin stories of the world or people. Right. Uh, I wonder, 
Should, do you want to go first or should I go first on the, on the origin of coffee thing that I heard? Um, well, I, I guess I'll just give, cause it might be the same thing is, uh, What's there your- was, I think some monks in Africa, they were no- noticing like the livestock they're attending were having like strange energetic, like behaviors. And they're like, what is it that they're eating? And, uh, so first they are like, well, let's try, uh, see if it's a leaf. So they like made some tea or something out of the leaves. And they're like, no, it's can't be the leaves. And then they figured out it was the, the, the seed inside the, the cherry eventually. And that's like the origin of coffee is what I, what I remember reading. Is that what you read? That's pretty, the, I mean, yeah, that's uh pretty spot on. And since, I mean, I literally just started reading it this morning uh, after the beach workout, I was like, Oh, I wanted to check this out. And so it is, and I'd have to get really specific on the the area. I know you said Africa, and I kind of wonder, because it was very, the names were like Imdula, and uh, it did mention Allah, uh, so I know there was some Muslim. In- yeah, there was. Yeah, and so they were, actually was goats. When you said goats, I was like, bingo. <laughs> it was their goats, and they, they were describing the goats as just being kind of lazy and you know, like little bursts of energy, but sleeping a lot of the day. And then all of a sudden they're sleepless and they're up all night and they're being crazy. And one of the people in the monastery, there was a monastery actually involved and in this story. And it was, uh, he said, oh, it's the goat sucker bird. And the other guys were like, dude, there's no such thing as a goat sucker bird. And he said, no, it's the goat sucker bird that like nibbles on the teeth of the goat at night and it's driving them crazy. And that's why their eyes are red and uh, and that's why they're sleepless. But then they said, well, we're going to figure something else out because you're crazy. It's not this goat sucker bird. The thing doesn't drive the goats nuts. So they they had a book of herbs and they because um, they realized the goats have been eating this plant. They're like, it has to be a tree. Excuse me. It has to be this tree, eating the leaves off the tree. And then uh, they're like, well, it's not in our herb book. Maybe it's from someone's home garden. They grew something special and it, it escaped into the world and grew wild. And they're like, no, it's it's not that. Uh, and then they, they essentially figured out um, they were doing all these different things and cracking open the, uh, what do you call it? Not the bean, but the, uh, what, do you, what do you call the the part, the, the, what do you call it, the blossom or the bud? of it, the- It's like a cherry, you know, it's yeah. like a, uh, in, in Spanish, they, they call it a uva. Uh, like a grape cherry. I just coffee cherries. Yeah. Let's, let's go with that okay. coffee cherry part. And that's, and that's essentially like just them experimenting and investigating through this process of like cracking it open and grinding it and trying to boil it and just like almost just experimenting and well, literally experimenting. And part of what's neat about that too, and that's how they discovered you know, and then they turned into the the black or brown, however you want to describe it, uh, water. And then it ties into some religious things too, in terms of uh, Allah serving someone a cup of coffee. And it talks about this guy going into races and being able to, with you know, sustain 10, 12 thoughts at a time. It's the first Red Bull energy drink. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion, no. <clears throat> if anybody out there is a big fan of Red Bull or if you're a big fan of Red Bull, great. But I, something gets me about, like, I enjoy coffee. By the way, what am I drinking here? Right? This is a, a kombucha uh, with some mushroom stuff in it. But uh, I, don't, I don't feel right when the things are artificial versus something natural. Like uh, I agree. I, in college, I drank it, Red Bull, not anymore. But... Um, with, with coffee specifically kind of now that we're on the subject about the energy drink is I, I think the best purest energy drink is just a black nitro coffee you know, or just black cold coffee. It, I mean, it's think about it. It's, it's, it's pure less than five calories, no sugar, and you get energy out of it. And if you do it on a cold brew, there's little, little to no acid in it at all. So it's, basically the pH is like your bodies. So So I I like cold brew. I don't understand it though. So what's the difference? Like, how does that, so the pH is different. What, I mean, what's the difference? Okay. What is cold brew? I guess that's the best way to put it. 
crazy. So it's basically just, uh, you know, you brew coffee or like drip coffee maker, you brew it hot and that extracts the flavor like real fast. So cold brew is just, um, it's brewing coffee with cold water over time. So typically like 12 hours, you just put some coffee in a mason jar, stick it in the fridge overnight. And the next day you have your, you strain it and you have cold brew and it's, um, you should try it because uh, the flavor profiles are, are pulled out of it in a different way. And uh, it, there's a smoothness to it um, that you don't, you don't necessarily get with like a hot brew coffee. So um, you can kind of equate it to like a uh, kombucha, like you're, you're drinking now is uh, my wife brews this uh, just in her house with, you know, it, it brews in, well, you make tea and then you brew it over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, it's a, it's a more pure form. Like the sugar gets like broken down kind of more of a, a vinegar flavor. So there's, there's no sugar in it. So, um, actually the first time I tried cold brew was with, uh, with our, our Nicaraguan coffee. And I'm like, this is a completely new experience. Like I could not believe there was no sugar in it. Cause it, it, there was a sweet, a sweetness to it. So, um, you should try it out sometime. Well, I, I actually, I had some cold brew this morning. Uh, so I, I drink it and I know like, that's what I, I like, and it does taste like there's a, uh, like sometimes you, you know, when you read the the description of a coffee bean, it says like chocolatey, you know, nutty flavor, whatever it might be. You can get hints of it, in my opinion, in the, you know, when it's hot, but the cold brew does have an extra like, hey, here it is. It does. Yeah. Definitely. I didn't know the process of making it because I, when you're saying it's a long brewing process, I think if I go to a drive through and get a nitro cold brew, I didn't realize it'd been sitting there for 12 hours. Now, almost thinking about the nitro, does that mean they're able to brew it faster or they're literally? Uh, Yeah, it's just putting, you know, nitrogen, like they, they put carbonation into like, uh, like beer. Um, but it's, it's nitro. So it's like a stout, it's like a coffee stout in a way, like you're drinking a Guinness. Um, and it does take, take a little bit away from the flavor profile and you exchange it for that, that, that fizziness. Um, so you, you could do it in your fridge without it. And, um, yeah, I mean, you could just Google how, how to do cold brewing. It's, it's, it's super simple, but yeah, I mean, you drink that before you go work on the beach. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna wake up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's interesting. The way caffeine influence is us at different times or, or in different ways, you know, across different people. Like I've, generally discovered for the most part for several years that I will drink my caffeine after I do everything in the morning, like the workout and the meditation and journal and kind of my normal process. Although in the last few months, and this was like The Rock or Dwayne Johnson that actually influenced me to, to, to try a little bit differently and drink my coffee before workouts. And I didn't do that today. I'm like, I want the kick afterwards. But I, um, I have been doing it before my workouts, and it it has a different impact on me mentally. I, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Do you? Uh... Yeah. Well, I guess my routine now for the last uh, we've been living in this house a little over two years. Um, it's blurring in my mind, but um, now I just I. I start the coffee, I go feed the animals, I come back in and ready, ready to go in the winter time. Like, well, we're coming into spring now here, but it's still freezing in the morning. You walk out and that cold air hits your face. You're awake, but then it's, uh, you know, sitting down and just having that cup of coffee. It's like, all right, now I'm ready for the day. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's a huge thing. I mean, it's a, it's a global, um, in terms of the interest in coffee, you know, I, I remember reading, this is probably a, a year or two ago, uh, about coffee becoming really popular in Europe. And yeah. there was a period of time where the water was really poor quality. So people were actually drinking beer all the time because it was, they needed some kind of liquid or fluid to quench that thirst. Even though in my mind, it's like, wouldn't that dehydrate you more? But it was right. better than the water quality because I couldn't drink water. And then someone, 
you know, introduce coffee to, to Europe from further south or further from the east. Yeah. Drastically shifted everything. People are like, whoa, I can think all day. I have clarity of thought. And then coffee houses became this hub of people doing business. Right. Their mail delivered. And it was known as the spot where it didn't matter if you were an aristocrat, some super, you know, royalty, very wealthy, or if you were the person that, you know, had slept on the corner that night, you could come into the coffee house and everybody was neutral and equal and could have conversation or debates. Yeah, for sure. And um, it was interesting. I read this piece in National Geographic, um, the kids version of the magazine, because my son gets it. And it was it was the history of the cocoa bean. And it was very fascinating. So it's older than coffee. And then there used to be um, basically hot chocolate houses, chocolate houses in Europe. They were only for like the richest people could afford chocolate at that time. So it was for the elites and then coffee came in and then uh, the, the trade just like boomed around it. So it became affordable to your common folk. So they never thought, I guess the history is like, they didn't think coffee could ever take over chocolate um hot chocolate houses but but it did so there's there's so much history around like basically yeah just a simple product trade um and then um that that just triggered another thought is there was a point because there was a lot of i think it was like a muslim more kind of product at the time because of where it was discovered um a whole bunch of christians in europe were 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 drinking it and uh, it kind of became a, a subject that they needed what they needed to figure out what the Pope thought of it. So uh, I guess they brought some coffee to the Pope when he tried it. He says, because some people were saying, oh, that's the devil's product. That's the devil's product. And, and, and the, the Pope at the time said, huh, something so good can't belong to the devil. <laughs> so he blessed the coffee. So it's just like, oh, that's that's just the beauty about you know, why, why I'm passionate about coffee is it, it helps integrate humanity, uh, on, on just a level like that. Like, oh yeah, you know what? Different customs, different foods, but you know, we can all like it and enjoy it. And it it brings us all together at the same, you know, table. Man, speaking of influence to the Pope, just when he says something like that and people go, okay, you know, that many masses of people, it, it made me think a, a bit because I, I know a few members of your family. Yeah. Uh, you and I have, have never really, you know, I think spoken about religion or, or beliefs at a, at, at a deep level or, or any level, really. Um, did that play a role in your, in your, in what you're doing? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, I, I kind of got introduced to this whole idea. Like I, uh, I went in, you know, out of college and I, I went to go work for a, a financial company, you know, basically selling like securities and life insurance. And, you know, I, I had some good mentorship um, and I was doing all right. I was doing it for like a year and a half, but I had like this emptiness inside of me. And I'm like, um, I started pulling away and like the guys around me could see that. And then you know, they got me some like more coaching, like senior, senior coaches. And, uh, one of the guys, um, basically is like, well, this is, this is how you become successful. You have to hang around with wealthy people. And I'm like, uh, that didn't sit right. I, I didn't want that to be the reason why I hung out with people. It's like their, you know, wealth and status. So that was like the closer for me. I'm like, I got to pull back. And, uh, I, that's when I, decided to join it was a it's a lay catholic mis- mission with like a a france so you know there's a lot of different like charisms in the catholic church and you you know saint francis of cz like he started an order and they're connected to the poor so i'm like i gotta go connect with the poor so i got i i joined a mission with this type of charism and then my eyes were open to like i'm like i'd rather hang out with poor people because they they they, you know, th- their value system, they care about what matters most in life and their teachers, you know, they might know less than you. Um, 
you know, when it comes to like reading, writing and arithmetic, but they know more than you and like the ways of life. So when I went down there, it just opened my eyes and um, I spent time like in, in the mountain villages and uh, I'm like, this, this land is just so rich. Like I just saw like the richness in the land, like you could cut like a thing off of uh, a mango tree, like a branch it's sticking in the ground and it'll grow. And you're like, well, there's so much food here. Like how, how come there's like people starving in the city, you know? And you, so I, I was just like doing some major soul searching. Um, and I'm like, I want to be able to help. I can't live here forever because I'm running out of money. Um, so I just kind of conceived this idea, like to get involved in the coffee trade. I'm like, if I can buy their products direct, like I, I could still stay in touch with them. Um, in a in just a business way but the thing they need is you know if they're living a family's living on five dollars a day like if all of a sudden they get ten dollars a day fifteen dollars a day like well then they can maybe afford some dental care or send their kids to school and um that's kind of where it started for me so there was a there there was a big faith element in in the journey because um when I started looking for missions, I was looking for Catholic missions. Um, And that's what led me to, to Honduras and the whole backstory to how I got involved in coffee. Wow, man. So that's your first, I, uh, I lived in Brazil, like in Northern, Northern Brazil, and there was a strong Catholic influence, a lot of holidays because of it. The city there was having its 400th birthday anniversary while I was there. Um, Catholicism has influenced a, a tremendous amount of people on the on the planet. Uh, Honduras. So let's think about some of your different types of coffees too, like Nicaraguan. You got the Brazilian. So that yeah. was the very first. What was your first, like, I guess deal? I mean, that's such a beautiful mission, man. To go, wow, you know, they're living off five dollars a day. How do we get it to ten? How do we get to fifteen? I, I I'm such a big believer in a win-win situation, like helping others. Yeah opens up the door to receive and to help our ourselves. When I say ourselves, I mean our family, those around us, you know, live the way that uh, we were in, intended to live. Uh, what was your first, like, I guess, is you, would you call it a deal? How would you describe your first interaction in terms of setting that up? Yeah. So there was, there was a lot of trips back and forth between like when I was in Honduras and I actually failed a couple times, you know, and you, you learn a lot, you know, through that failure, trying to set, set up, uh, basically a, a deal. Um, and then I, it brought me to Nicaragua where, uh, you know, with business, it's like, you, you gotta get involved with like people you can trust. Um, and unfortunately, you know, trust is really broken in our society, but there's a lot of people worthy of our trust. So, um, I went to Nicaragua and, and made friends with a guy, American guy who's been living there over a decade. And he's like, he introduced me to his friends who were farmers and um, they had all the exporting stuff. Like apparently it's super easy to do it in, in, in Nicaragua to get your license to export like Honduras, Colombia, other, it's, it's very diff, difficult to do this. So they were able to get their exporting license. I was able to trust them. Um, you know, I, I sent them money on a handshake. Um, it was 2000 pounds worth of coffee. So, uh, about $6,000. And I just, I just had the discomfort that they were going to fulfill the order and not just burn me. So, um, yeah, they, they did everything they said they would. And the next time around we bought 12,000 pounds, um, for 30 some thousand dollars and uh we're still in touch with them and you know it's a friendship now like they want our success because it's tied into their success and um that's that's kind of where i am with guadalupe roastery like i i you can only be good at like so many things so i'm like let me just stay focused on this relationship help build this model and then um pass it off to like other people. And and actually we talked about this, Derek is like, we need a Brazilian connection. Um, 
you know, let somebody else take care of that. Um, that has a passion and capacity to do it well and and build those relationships because at the end of the day, like, you know, businesses, it's, it's relationships, turns into transactions of money. But, you know, before that transaction happens, you, you build the relationship. So um, that's kind of where we're at with that. Beautiful, man. That The trust, when you just put it out there in the essence of faith and just get a good feeling off of it. You know, sometimes when I hear somebody saying, Oh, I got, I got burned by this. I'm pretty fortunate that, that I believe the people around me don't generally think like, Oh, someone burned me. They usually go, Oh, I could have done better in this area or that area. Like there's a lot of accountability with the people around me. And that feels like really yeah, a huge fan of that. There's never a blame thing. And I shouldn't say never, you know, every once in a while, it's easy. We're human. Those right. things. But uh, to take that, that leap of faith and get a good feeling, there's something special about those types of moments too. Um, whether it's business or maybe a relationship. I mean, you're, you're married. How, how long have you been married? Um, oh, that's funny. Eight years. I almost forgot. Yeah. Is it and he's uh, like now or <laughs> uh, say it again? Oh, he said I almost forgot. Like uh, you forgot you were married or? <laughs> oh no, I just forgot how many years because I was like I was, oh. I was seven. I'm like no, it's eight. It's gonna be nine in in uh, this coming October. So it just it's amazing how, how life speeds up the older you get. It's it, it it's so true. Like hmm. you're sitting in you know whatever you enter your freshman year of college, you think you're you're going to be there forever. And then all of a sudden I graduated and like a decade passes. But when you're, when you're in college, you're like, man, this is never going to end, but then, you know, it's over. So um, yeah, that's why I forgot about how long I've been married. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she, uh, she won't see this and you'll stay safe. Your secret is safe here. Uh, oh, she, she'll. Well, it's funny. Her and I did an interview the other day, and um, it, they asked us about our first date. I thought it was over coffee, and it wasn't. And so she had to correct me, and she's like, "No, we went out for sushi." I'm like, "It was our second date. It was over coffee." I'm like, "Oh, that that was that was the one when when I I told her." my whole passion about this coffee business and cooperative and, and, and uh, I'm like, yeah, that was the one I kind of just laid on everything about my dreams was over coffee That's and she didn't run and she, she, she actually has been, you know, my number one fan and support for this. So, um, and she's, yeah. When she writes about the business, I'm like, I can't wait to you just post a blog. She started blogging about this because, um, uh, I like reading your blogs and your perspective on this. It actually helps me get to know her more and it helps me get to know the business more like what we're actually impacting. Okay. Is she blogging, uh, for Guadalupe or on her own? So she's the one that writes the Guadalupe blogs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So she was very active with it for a while. And then we started this farm and it was, it was a 150 year old dairy farm. So it was, it was in ruins when we bought it. Um, and then we just been restoring it for two years. And then last month she started blogging again. So she just launched, uh, well, through our social media pages, we just launched one last week and the next one's going to launch March 9th. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, I will keep an eye out on that. I know the newsletter started coming and I was like, all right, it's pretty cool. I've been responding to a couple like, Hey, this is some neat information i like what you got going on here i can't i'm not recalling when i had my first order of uh of your coffee beans i i have it has been really fun and exciting just be, i think because of the way i like to watch businesses grow and i just love people seeing people grow and succeed and develop things and from your you know your online presence to your packaging i'm not sure if you've if you're running the the Instagram at all, but like I'm getting tagged in some of my friends' posts or even people that I just know or even don't know from social media that are like opening up their first package and tagging me and uh, someone just ordered the the Nicarag Nicaraguan and then 
I saw the Brazilian one. And even the, uh, there's a guy that we actually just, we just recorded an episode last week and last week, and he lives really close. He's a, a trainer here in La Jolla. And I saw him post and that big, beautiful Brazilian package. And then one of my friends, who's a nutritionist in Brazil and a, and a trainer, she's awesome. I get a response from her because he tagged me. And so it's like, just need to see the, the impact of that. And also to know what's going on in the back end, that you're doing this from a place of, of care and love and serving the people locally, whether it's Brazil or Nicaragua. Um, yeah, man, what has that experience been like to just watch it grow and, and see that continue? Yeah, it, it's, um, I never thought I'd, you know, kind of be in the position with Guadalupe that I am in. Like, I never thought I would turn into this, but I would say the biggest thing, like in the learning curve for um, me in business was, um, you know, we have a tendency, or at least me, like you want to control something because that's how it should go. Uh, You're like, this is how it should go. And then all of a sudden there became a point where I'm like, you know, I need, I need to let go of control. Um, And this is kind of, you know, my relationship with God is like, okay, God, you're, you're in charge, you know, just let me help fulfill whatever your plans are for me. But like, kind of like the breakthrough moment, like I, I feel like for Guadalupe is when, when, when I, when I let go, like kind of just like in my prayer life and then I let other people do the job that they're good at. So um, I guess if I could sum it up, it's like, you know, I have faith in God, but then um, you, you have to have faith in people too. Um, and trust that God's got a job and purpose for them. And they're going to do it better than you because you can't be a specialist at everything. Um, you know, some people are, are really, they, they want to master Instagram. They want to master Twitter, Facebook. They want, or somebody who just wants to master like the packaging for Guadalupe or the presentation. Um, people have these types of passions. Like they're like, okay, that, you know, get evaluated like all the time in business, you know, from customers or employees or partners. And it's, it's good. And actually Derek is like, I got super excited about your platform because that is, that's the human side of just Derek or other people is like, you know, God's got a job for everybody, you know? And, and it's like, when you find that, um, it really doesn't become work anymore. Uh, now, now I say that cause I still have a day job that pays my bills. <laughs> That's work, but you know, the family life and the farm in Guadalupe, like, uh, it's, it's something where it's just like, it's, you know, it's vocational. So discovering that was, uh, it was, it was a journey, but kind of like when I feel like Guadalupe started being like really successful is when, I just let go and let other people basically show me what Guadalupe needs. Um, and it's still a process because we, as on the phone yesterday, um, we, I'm not the CEO, I'm the founder of Guadalupe Rosary. We, we took on a, a venture capital group to manage the company in regards to like funding it and, and doing all the accounting. Um, Cause that's what kills me. Like when I get stuck in like the accounting books and tax laws and codes, like I'm like, this is taking me off the mission. Like, so I was really happy to strike this deal with these partners and, and they're great. So I was talking to the CEO on our Friday calls and it's very casual. It's nothing formal. He calls me when he has time and I pick up when I have time, but when he's calling, I'm like, I, I can't wait to talk to John. Um, you know, John, John was interviewing, uh, possibly a new chief of marketing officer for us. And uh, he, in the interview, this guy evaluated the company of all our weak spots. And uh, he's like, I don't know if I could I t- basically the gist of the conversation is uh, he, he didn't have, he doesn't think he has the support to do the job. And I just said, I said to John, I'm like, we're, we know we got gaps. Like we're looking for somebody to fill those gaps. Like, uh, you know, like, teamwork makes a dream work. Like if you're, if you're running a football team and 
the running back keeps shooting at once gap, like somebody on the team's got to fill that gap, you know, cause you're getting beat. Um, so that's kind of like where like the people who have the passion and identify that gap, like allowing them to come in and just take control of that. It's, and then seeing them come alive, come alive in that, in, in, in their job. It, it's just, it's been an amazing journey that way. Well, and, and recognizing that uh, takes a lot of humility and humility is really, really powerful. You have people that can be very, very successful without it. Uh, I generally, when I, when I see that believe that there's a lot more chaos and, you know, frustration and things that wouldn't need to exist. Uh, if a little more humility were injected and go, Hey, I'm, I'm not a specialist at this. I'm not a specialist at that. Why don't, you know, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation and work to generate the most positive outcome uh, and, and recognize that, man. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's uh, one of the reasons I, I could believe that you've continued the success and, and grown the success that you've, you've had, you know, that, that chief marketing officer position, it, I was reading about this a couple of weeks ago. I actually Googled, you know, what is the current role of the, of the CMO? And just the, the differences and opinions of that. And to think about the evolution of marketing where 60, 70 years ago, or however, you know, we might be a little off on the decades, but it was TV, you know, radio and newspapers. And that's where you got all of your information, most of your information, not all, most of it. And now uh, the transmutation of that, and it really is so diverse. I mean, you have to have an online presence. However, you know, like if you're running Facebook ads or something like that, like that'll never reach me. So you have to have someone in the role that understands the whole audience. You were asking, you know, what's the target audience or things like that. And that's a very standard, like, you know, marketing perspective. But when it comes to brand or just long-term success, having those people that can stay open and, and curious uh, to everything is really powerful. I mean, you know, I do a ton of work in the, in the print media world. And it's funny because I'm a huge fan of like this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a thousand percent social media. I also believe he doesn't even know about some of the print work with companies like Best Version Media that that happens. And so it is um, it is interesting, but he's obviously doing pretty well. So, you know, not all things for for all people. Uh, just kind of out of curiosity, did, is the guy hired? Do you have a new CMO? Um, he's going to get an offer. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll see if he takes it, you know? Ooh. Yeah. That's exciting times. How, where do you imagine the business to be in three years, five years, however long? Yeah, I I would say um, I we're growing like a, I would say like an oak tree. It's not like massive, explosive. We're, I haven't see, we haven't seen any exponential curves, which is which is good. Um, but I feel like our model could all of a sudden get picked up by a major distributor because uh, they like the brand. They like the basically the connectivity we bring to the supply chain because we're directly sourcing. Um, the coffee market is is interesting because um, consumers are driving it, uh, obviously through service, but they want to know where their money's going. Um, this is just all over. And, you know, and I would say what, you know, like a Starbucks did to the, the coffee market when they started making like political statements, it was devastating to their business here. Not so much like they're growing in China and the East, but um, lots of stores shut down because people are like, we're, we're not going to a coffee shop over a political issue. We're, we're going to coffee shop over personal issues. So I think the whole market's like moving in this way, in that direction. Um, I think you're going to see more and more home roasters. Um, 
And I think people are going to get more connected because it's, it's, you can, you can roast uh, coffee in your oven. It's not as evenly roasted, but you could get like a popcorn maker with a stir on it and it's more evenly roasted. I think you're going to see a lot more uh, younger people start saving money, buying green beans and just roasting it on their oven top. Um, that's where I think it's going in like five years. Um, eventually we want to be part of that. And, you know, I would say we're, we're, the company is not so much of like a, a multi-market consolidator, maybe like in the Catholic Christian space, because of our, our name comes from our lady of Guadalupe, who's the, the Mexican, um, she appeared in Mexico, like I think in the 14, 1500s. Um, but just in the whole market as in, in, in general is if we could force the conversation into like, you know, um, we're seeing it with supply chain, supply chains matter, especially if you like your cup of coffee every morning, like if that gets disrupted, um, well, uh, then we've got to give up coffee. It's not the end of the world, but I don't want to give up coffee. <laughs> I, I love sitting down and having a cup of coffee with my wife or friends. Um, and just, there's a lot of ambiance behind it. But I think we can force the conversation in that direction is like, all right, everybody's decision matters. Um, if I could be one step closer connected to somebody who's never had a chance to read or write and my coffee purchase allows them to go to school or for the first time, I, I think by and large, like humanity, that's like a, you can rally the whole market behind stuff like that. So um, I think it's naturally just going in that direction. Um, we're on the tidal wave to hopefully be able to eventually, this will be my primary job. So if you, I mean, one man, if you had a kit right now that were available online and it, it was like an instruction, like a little instructional or attached to some kind of YouTube video, and it was a, a kit of like, here's how to roast your beans. I buy that thing in a heartbeat just to at least try it. When you were talking about kombucha, I, I have, uh, you know, kombucha kits. I've made some kombucha. Eventually, my scoby, you know what the scoby is? That thing you're... Yeah, I'm just, I'm just learning about this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. It. Uh, I mean, that thing didn't stop growing and I felt it really did feel alive. So I was like sharing scobies with people and it got to the point where I was like, all right, I think there's a like another sentient being in my kitchen and I got I didn't want to throw it out it was like it was a fun experience to be able to do that from home it's it was it can, you know that took a considerable amount of time and, and space as I was brewing it and uh, a lot of fun but coffee I mean it is for me it has become you know going from the instant coffee to the machine that would grind the beans automatically now to French press and heating up espresso on the uh, on the stove or pour over, like it has become over time, just all these fun different habits. And that, that'd be something yeah. I'd buy the kit tomorrow if you had it. Um, well, yeah, well, I'll help develop it. So I'll let you know when it's ready. Um, let me know. Yeah. yeah I just, it's like when you're just talking about that, it's like there, there's just something to being connected to your stuff you consume. Um, and yeah, I think uh, as we've been seeing, just like the transgression of like markets, it's like there's a, the, the farmers markets, the localism, it, you know, people, th those are people look for that now. And I think it's, I don't think it's going to stop, especially, you know, with the whole COVID pandemic, when certain things just like got almost impossible to buy, like, like toilet paper, it's like, I live in Wisconsin. Like, why couldn't I find toilet paper? Like there's, this is where the paper industry is, you know? Um, now that's an extreme example, but I hope that doesn't, I, I'm, I'm going to make sure that does not happen to coffee. <laughs> there you, go. you know, and there's, so maybe you can help with the uh, education, that book we were talking about, the world Atlas of coffee. I feel like I'm doing free marketing for whoever wrote this book, James Hoffman there, but uh, it was talking about like the very beginnings is from the coffee tree and pests and diseases is like one of the first things it starts off with. So it talks about how there is, a, is it Arubica? And there's like yeah. two primary types of, of beans and that 
because of the global coffee industry, we essentially don't have a lot of coffee uh, plant diversity. And like what happened to the wine industry, where a bunch of wine crops got uh, really destroyed when this one thing sort of took over and, and transferred and moved, that the coffee environment is very susceptible to something like that. Yeah. So um, I'm not an expert on this subject, but one of the, he was our primary roaster for a while. He's Colombian, but his work visa expires. So he's back in Colombia. And uh, they're on the front lines of all, everything coffee in, in Colombia, right? So he's been visiting farms because he's exploring our direct relationships there. And um, they're, they're big on the genetic diversity there. So they're on the front front end of that. So um, that's just where it's like, you, you think about like, people have like this sixth sense of just like survival, right? Um, well, the Colombians have that with their coffee. So, you know, there has been, it, it, it has hit like lots of farms that call it like the rust, the La Roya. And it, it's hit the farm that we partner with in Nicaragua where their harvest wasn't as good. Um, in yield, you know, they still were able to get good sh- coffee beans out of it. Um, so when that happens, like maybe coffee prices do spike, but Colombia is going to sell them all their seeds. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, and that's why that's, that's how, you know, the market figures itself out, um, you know, on a global scale and why Colombia is still one of the wealthiest countries in South America is because of their coffee and their just, uh, ingenuity to be able to figure things, you know, have that foresight to figure things out like that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty confident just with, um, you know, people are, are, are going to be more diverse with their planting or farmers, but also like, I get a lot of emails about like eco-friendly things and, um, uh, just organic versus all natural. And, um, you know, even, even the farmers, if they can't afford to go completely organic or, um, they are all natural, like all of them besides your, like your big industrial farms, because none of them want to spray pesticides on their leaves. You know, they might put some fertilizer on top of the roots, but it's not going into the actual plant. You know, and some of these words like organic have become such a, a marketing ploy in some cases, not all cases. And I'm like, I'm asking myself, like, am I, am I even organic anymore? What does that mean? And then, right. I know you've mentioned direct source and I don't have a lot of information about what, you know, single source origin or direct source means, but I I hear these things and it kind of ties into what you're talking about. People care where things come from and are more connected to the people. And a lot of that I believe is because we have more time, you know, time is really interesting because if you look at what technology does to give us time, if we use it properly, I mean, before we had fire, you spent a lot of time, you know, making food and chewing it. Fire was essentially technology. So that sped up that process. And now we have, you know, pocket computers. Uh, we've got all these things that give us more time to actually go, hey, where does this coffee bean come from? What is, I mean, help, help me understand what, what is direct source or single source or, or what does that mean even? All right. So um, this s- single source or single origin, it comes from, you know, what plot of land, what farm it's coming from. So, um, and direct source is, and I don't know if we coined it, but this is what we started calling it. Um, I started calling it transparent trade because I want to put transparency on trade. Um and then we started calling it direct source. It's basically we're connected to the farmers. They're the exporters. And the transaction actually takes place between the farmer and Guadalupe Roastery. And we call it direct source. So there's no um, you know, broker or mill in between, you know, taking their cut. Now, um our farmers roll in Lorena, they still work with the mill and the mill loves them down there because they pay them to basically set, put their 
beans in the sack. So it's good business on multiple levels. So it's like, um, you know, this is a learning process. Like you go into like a different country that's poor and try to do business. Um, you don't want to get anybody in trouble. Um, you know, and we've, you know, it doesn't matter if it's whatever political party they're down there, they're constantly battling, you know, you've heard of the Sandinistas, they're, they're sympathetic to the communists. Um, and then the Contra, which are just more, uh, free market people. Um, we can go in a country like Nicaragua and it's like, these people, they just want to live. Uh, we're not, we're not cutting anybody out of their local supply chain. Um, we might be in Miami, somebody who's warehousing, you know, 10 million pounds of coffee that, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting those people out. So, um, we won't be on the radar screen unless we got as big as Starbucks someday, but even, even at that point, um, well, that'd be fun. That, that'll that be a fun battle to have at that point to, <laughs> to make some enemies with, with somebody who's, who's looking at, uh, having a banana Republic forever versus, uh, a free country. Yeah. Pressure is a privilege. Big, big things require big battles. Sometimes, you know, there's, I'm not sure how familiar you are with, with blockchain, but when you're talking about transparency and, and trust, you know, as I'm looking at things and researching and studying and kind of comparing what I know to what I don't know and what I'm learning, um, that is a huge, plays a huge factor in business down the road or can play a huge factor because you have certain countries that, you know, it's interesting with, there's so many things to tie together here in terms of like, so Elon Musk launching Starlink, which is going to make it so that anybody on the planet essentially can have internet access. Now, a lot of people already do it the way satellites works and things, but he's really gone. Nope. It's global. Like everybody's getting Wi-Fi. Uh, it, I looked at the pricing, it seemed a little expensive if I were to live in a place where I'm making, you know, $5 a day and that supports my family in a village. However, you know, that guy maybe does something a little bit different in, in those circumstances so that everybody can truly have access to it or, or, or shifts it in some way. And then you think about blockchain. So I think about more people having access to cryptocurrency and being able to cut out the middle man in terms of financial institutions and having <laughs> trust and security of, of not needing to go hey, here comes, you know, I'm going to give you $10,000 cash or something like that. Like there's more, more security from a distance. And then you throw in the factor of, you know, local government influence or, or large government influence. And since you said, hey, you know, partnership in Brazil, those kind of things, my experience living in Brazil and California uh, compared to I me, mean, if you look at the pandemic, and how different states operated, how people felt in different states, how it impacted uh, health systems, how it didn't impact some health systems. And you roll all that together. For one, I get really excited even thinking about how all of these things can converge and come together. And, and you know, will the government do something to uh, undermine cryptocurrency and say, this is too powerful. They're, they don't even need us anymore for the transfer of cash and try to restrict it. And Brazil, yeah. you know, Brazil could be a great example of that. Just the import export tax. Like I, uh, it's hard for me to send things to friends. One, they don't even know if it's going to get there. There's a lot of corruption right. uh, when things come in. So if somebody sees something they like, they might just keep it. And then that's what it is. There's no, hey, where'd that package go? And if it does go through, the import tax alone, now they, they say my understanding from, from my friends that live in Brazil is that it's to preserve the culture. And, and they have done an incredible job of preserving Brazilian culture in Brazil. So if that is really part of it, that's fantastic. But at one point, does it hurt the people there to not allow for some of that more individual exchange? Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's a great way to break it down. I'm just trying to process like <laughs> it, it, we're definitely like going in a, a direction that um you know 
it's interesting. Well, the paradox is like, it's the globalization, but like, there's like this localism um, that I think we're all embracing too. So kind of how they, they converge on one another. So we can preserve, you know, uh, the identity of our community that, that we love so much. And, um, but also, you know, stay in a, a global environment where it's, you know, they're, I can see, how, basically I can see how they can work together, I, but that, that's I, when, when it comes to like, I, I just, you know, people's sixth sense of just figuring things out, the entrepreneurship in them, the creativity in them, um, you know, government interference, you know, if they, if they interfere in something that they shouldn't like shame on them, you know, that's when the people come out with pitchforks and just, you know, converge on, uh, you know, government centers that we've kind of been seeing that civil unrest like increase, which obviously like nobody wants, nobody wants that type of unrest, but um, there's definitely like a conflict that I feel like between the people who want to control it and, and centralize it versus like, let us be free and local. Yeah. And I, I can only imagine how many people are in the United States, Do you know, 300, 400 million people, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Yeah, and one thing that's really funny is how much, to me, I, I sort of laugh at this, is, is how much politics um, are such a hot topic, and then you see the voter turnout, and you see that less than half of the population of the U.S. actually voted in the last election, so it's like, I don't want to hear people talk about politics, what if they didn't vote, uh, yeah. or maybe, maybe I would love to hear their reason why they didn't vote, that could be pretty right. powerful, but how do you... And I don't like the word manage, maybe lead is a better term. How do you lead 300, 400 million people, whatever that number is? If it's over a million, that's already insane. So you can't let everybody have a, a sense of, you know, you're going to get some bad apples in a bunch that big. Like, all right, everybody go for it. Whatever feels great. Like complete right. freedom can create uh, a lot of disorder you know, unsafe practices. You can see that in other countries clearly when you compare or or just break down the difference in, in places where there is a, a tighter government. On the other hand, you go, you know, too tight on that and you limit people and restrict them. So it's it's got to be challenging. I can imagine, though, there, there has to be a better way. And it's weird to say that in America, this is arguably, you know, we are looked at as, leaders of the quote-unquote free world and the the pandemic though shed a light on what that means you know new zealand uh how they handled it now they're a a super they can essentially be a super remote place but it, it seems like from the outside looking in they really figured out some amazing ways to, to run a government. I don't even know what the population of, of New Zealand is. I imagine it's not 300 million people or 400 million people, but I want to say it's 4 million. Is it 4 million? Okay. You got that. They got that stat. I'm going to need an assistant or some faster Google reflexes so I can start Googling these things as they come up. But um, I mean, you, you obviously work with a group of people, both at a, at a family level and a, a business level, you know, taking that to 300 million people, what are some things that, that you found valuable leading people or, or working with groups? Um, yeah, I'll just say like identifying like people's strengths and passions, like and encouraging them in it is um, like we, there, there's a scene in, in Narnia. I, I, I love the scene is um, so like Peter is coming to like, it's ready for the, I think it's the first one, the battle, the one where they, they, you know, Aslan gets, you know, killed up by the white witch on the rock. But like right before that, Peter's fighting these two wolves and uh, like the assistants are coming to help the king. And then Aslan says to, to Peter, says to him, he says, no, let, this is Peter's battle. Let him fight it. So uh, I see that a lot of times, like in um, just people I work with is they want you to fight their battle for you. And then when you do it, it's, you're not doing them a favor. You're not helping them come to um, themselves. And um, 
that's, I usually just stand back and I, I think I probably get, uh, it's, it's probably what I get sworn at in private, like the most over is like, why didn't he help? He should have done this. He should have done that. And I was sitting back and just saying like that, that's your battle. Um, and it, this is interesting because, uh, uh, we we're, you're talking about it early on is, um, just basically like the, how people's like Genesis is, is different, like per culture. Um, there was a study done, uh, is basically studying a couple hundred different cultures, like how they bring their men to of age. Like, so, you, you know, you think about like the, the chief in bringing, uh, one of the boys to manhood and native American, you know, tribe, and they put them out in the bush and make them survive. Um, well, one thing that like all the cultures really had in common is that there was this coming to age and it usually wasn't the biological fathers to bring them to age. Hmm. So it was some, somebody else trusted in the community that is going to help this boy become a man. And, and, and this, this, this is, you know, for, you know, the study wasn't with, with women, but it, it, the example goes like, um, you know, we all have a battle to fight so we can grow up um, and then take care of, you know, our families when, when we're older is um, I think that's like where I, I would say like leadership it can be is when you actually pull back and let them fight the fight that they have to fight. And then when they win, their confidence builds. So, um, you know, you, you've been in sales, like there's a lot of rejection out there. Um, you know, and then, you know, and maybe it just wasn't right for the buyer. Um, and, and, and to recognize that, but, um, you know, when you can kind of overcome like, all right, you know, uh, your spot in the marketplace, cause the marketplace is, it, it's pretty, um, it can be vicious sometimes, you know, um, but it can be something beautiful as well. When two mutual parties come together and you both have something great to offer each other. Like in a transaction is like, we, it's a win-win. So uh, I would say, yeah, I guess that's probably the thing I, I learned most about leadership. I don't necessarily say it. I just practice it. Um, I, I never told anybody in Guadalupe. I probably should because they're like, that's why you're so hands off. <laughs> yeah. With, uh, with leadership, there's this really cool guy named John Berghoff. Uh, he was an old like Cutco sales rep and built a consulting company right now. And there's probably a lot more to be said for, for what it is and just a consulting company, but he's doing some great work. It's called Exchange. And I was at one of their events in 2019, you know, mid, early 2019. And he said, uh, it was December of 2019, I think is when I heard it. And it was that give and tell give while it feels good, but not until it hurts. And I almost think you could just replace that with help, you know, help while it feels good and, and help enough so that people are equipped with the tools. But if you help too much, you're really enabling. And that's not, that's going to hurt you because the mistake is most likely or whatever happens is going to be repeated until that lesson learned. And it's not, it's not helpful for them either. Uh, but you, you have to give them the right you know, equipment, you can't go, all right, run off into battle, figure it out, uh, have fun. You know, you have to go, here's the right tools and equipment. Uh, I can give you some, some pointers, some guidance, and, but the, you do have to get that battle experience in order to move on to the next round. And you said, hey, I should probably tell the folks at Guadalupe, here's why I'm hands off. Communication is so critical for you know, relationships for business. So I think that's pretty cool that you, you thought about that because I bet um, that extra transparency, man, could go, could go a massive, uh, you could do massive things with that. For sure. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good pointer for, for leadership. Cause uh, I, you know, I didn't really come into thinking that there would be, you know, 20 some employees for Guadalupe Roastery that, you know, um, we don't have a, you know, with us, we're still in a startup phase because it's been like a hobby for me. Like I, I kind of think of Guadalupe Roastery as me going to catechism and teaching confirmation class. 
Um, it's, it was always like business as a charity. Um, so there's definitely people looking for leadership uh, within the organization. Um, but also another thing to kind of talk a little bit further about leadership is, um, okay, now, now I'm just blanking on the train of thought. Um, it'll come back to me. All right. This was, this was good. It was so good. I forgot about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, no. The, the question that we should all be asking um, ourselves when we're at work, uh, is this the guy? is this the job God wants me to do? Um, and I've had that conversation with people before is like, um, they're just not happy. And well, there, you do have to make a living. Um, but if you're not happy in the work there, there is work for you out there, you know, uh, basically God's got a job for you now and just kind of vocationally find it. Um, and then when you find that job, um, you become alive in it. You, you want to master it. The challenges become, all right, well, how do I overcome this? And then um, you kind of just can basically lead through your example of um, I'm fulfilling the job God gave me and, um, I mean, you could look at it with like Mother Teresa, like an extreme example, like she, before she died, she had 4,000 sisters, you know, going out and to the poorest of the poor of the world and just caring for them, loving them. Um, that's leadership where, you know, she didn't have to really say that much. Now when she talked, like everybody listened. Um, so, you know, but also mother Teresa said is, you know, you want to go change the world, you know, go home and love your family. Um, so there's like a very like low, like you think of mother Teresa as global, you know, everybody knows about her. Uh, you think about what she said. Now that's like the smallest community you can possibly have is your family. And it's like, okay. So now, you know, like this, this balance of like discovering who you are in God um, that, that, that is what changes the world. That's what builds credibility. That's what, you know, um, conversations you have with people, they start to have more authority. The advice becomes greater. Um, you know, they're listening more and vice versa is, you know, if somebody's like truly trying to discover like who they are, um, you listen to them too, you know? Uh, so I think, uh, I think leadership, you know, now that we're talking about is, is really relational, relational, like driven. Um, it can be big, it could be small. Um, now, you know, for your non maybe Christian listeners is, you know, to like think about how Christianity was founded. It was founded in basically small groups, you know, uh, Jesus took 12, um, one betrayed him. Um, but most of his life, he spent it with, you know, small groups within them, like Peter, James, and John, like he revealed his divinity to them. Um, you know, then they would build relationships and, and that's how Christianity came to be. That everybody just about in the world knows who Jesus is. Um, so leadership can be, I think is ultimately, uh, not just imitating a saint, uh, because the thing all the saints have in common is they imitated Jesus. Um, so, uh, with my leadership, I just, I just think of like, well, how can I imitate Jesus better? Um, so I can come alive in, in that. Um, and I think my wife appreciates it too, because, uh, <laughs> my, I used to think I had to travel like mother Teresa to the poor and, and, um, I thought we were going to be a missionary family. I thought we were going to live in Nicaragua. I thought we were going to live with the poor. Like that's, if I had it my way, that's how it would have been. Um, but it was clear, like once we got married, like God had different plans for me. Well, that's cool, man. Ben, ben Franklin has these like 12 or 13, 14 virtues. And one of them is imitate 
Jesus and Socrates. Oh, and wow. Like, and, uh, yeah, right? Incredible. You know, some, it's whether it's business or life, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on a lot of things. We can find somebody or something, some process, some person, some behavior that's really great and work to imitate that. And through that process, I believe we can discover a lot about ourselves because we're also pushing ourselves to do something that maybe we haven't uh, done in the, in the past. And it's a really beautiful thing. You know, the hearing you describe uh, Christianity or faith, it's one of my favorite topics you know, the spirituality of things, because if you look over here, I've got literally have a Bible on my desk, it's got a few things in it. It's got the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants It's gifted to me by some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life that really showed me what uh, like love is in terms of, of relationships. And so it's really powerful to me. But then if you look over here, the art of worldly wisdom, you know, or I've got the Quran over here. And so I have yet to latch on to like a particular, you know, system, I guess you could call it. Yeah. What I have found and what I believe is if you go back far enough and look at text, the Epic of Gilgamesh or philosophy that um, our thinking, our thoughts have, have obviously evolved. And so you know, we have things like good vibes, bad vibes, you know, those kind of things that pop up or, or you know, the devil, God, Satan, these, these things. I ultimately believe that, you know, love, fear, it really all is, whether, however you're looking at it, to, to me, it, it feels very clear that there are only two, essentially, forces and, uh part of that self-discovery is, is combating Satan or the devil. However, you know, I feel like those words are even like, uh, feel magical with, with God, with love. Uh, and, and that everything can really open up when you, when you do that, whether you do it through Christianity or, uh, you know, yoga, I have some friends that are super hardcore Christians and, they're still my friends. They don't think any bad, any worse of me. I don't think that I go to hot yoga and, and some people believe that unlocks certain spirits, you know, that are going to infiltrate me and cause me harm. And I'm like, well, it's not like I'm sitting there in hot yoga, you know, checking out the girl's butt next to me. I'm there to like legitimately, it, it does something spiritually for me. I mean, some of the most humbling moments I've had in my life where I, I find myself actually thinking about God and saying thank you and being appreciative and grateful is after the lady down the street slays me with 90 minutes of Bikram yoga. I don't even know what the foundation of Bikram is, but I know when I'm in there, it's breaking my body down and my, my mentality and my emotions, the level that that can do after working through a lot of things, it, it does have a, a certain power. And so um, it's beautiful. It sounds like faith has played a massive role in you, understanding yourself the world around you and and led you on this quest to help so many others whether it's from the consumption of coffee to the growing of coffee and having an impact on these uh on these people yeah definitely um you know it's, it's very vocational um and that's why i'm the second day with my wife about nine years ago i had i had to let her know all about like this idea that just wasn't leaving me Cause, uh, it's like, if this works out, you're going to get this, like, it's going to be a, it's going to be a lifelong thing. And, um, you know, so yeah, nine years later, we're, we're still doing it. And, um, you know, there, there was several times, like I actually tried to just exit completely because, um, I identified like it, it's something that, um, the market wanted, uh, and, you know, when the market wants something, there's money behind it. And I was, I was selling the mission. I wasn't necessarily doing it for money. I started as a nonprofit, um, which then attracted an investor and then another investment group. 
Um, you know, so it's like the mission, the mission and it matters. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily care to master the tax code of whatever, you know, the IRS has for businesses, but, uh, I'm glad somebody does want to master that. Um, so just, you know, the vocational aspect of it is, um, you know, one step led to another. And, uh, this is, this is part of my journey. Like when the time comes to exit, I'll know, you know, um, you know, if it was up to me, I, I, I wish I could just afford a brand new John Deere <laughs> tractor and buy more acreage and just <laughs> go plant crops and watch it grow with my kids and take care of livestock. But, uh, you know, that, that type of, uh, that's, that's not in the cards right now. Maybe someday it will be. Well, I, I believe, uh, you know, since you are a man of God, that one of my personal beliefs is that we are designed to be infinitely wealthy. And a part of that money is, you know, what's currency? Currency is current, current is energy. And that giving and receiving money is an exchange of that, that energy. I believe the more energy you put into helping others and, and serving others, uh, the more you'll be able to express yourself with your John Deere because you'll have more uh, funds and income and, and gifts from God, man. So that's part of the creation. And, you know, some people disagree with that in a big way and, and think it's... Oh, that's, that's interesting you say that. Um, <laughs> I heard somebody say like two of the th- essential things for life are, are water and energy. So you, <laughs> when you just said said that, I'm like, uh, that, that rings true. There you go. I, you know, I remember sitting on a remote island in northern Brazil, being around folks that, you know, were, were super happy people. And their energy was put into very simple things. Hey, we're going to have fish today for dinner, Derek. Let's go catch the fish. And yeah. it's awesome. We're going to go catch dinner. And I'm sitting out there and throwing the line out with this little girl named Sophia and her brother and their family. And like, and it was so cool and it's so special. And like, this is everything that um, you could really want in a sense of there, there is nothing extra, like getting to spend time with people and love. And then coming back to America and getting tied into the rat race a little bit and, and kind of working through that and going, okay, there is, you know, depending on, on where you are and, and what you're doing, I think we have a responsibility to uh, help ourselves be put in a position to be able to help others if that's our, you know, if that's our calling. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, helping people like your, uh, your intro is helping people discover who, who they are is, uh, we're all, we're all looking for it, you know? And, uh, actually the first t-shirt that I made for Guadalupe, uh, I wish I had a better graphics person at the time because it was a awesome saying, but it was, you know, be who God created you to be and you'll set the world on fire. Um, you know, just finding out like your identity. That's just uh, so, so powerful. Well, I believe you're going to be lighting some more beans on fire with the roastery. I also believe the wife is going, hey, buddy, when are we going to go shopping? So, yeah. Uh, how would you love to just throw some plugs out there? How do people uh, find you? In fact, I do a bit of a commercial. You probably haven't heard it yet. In fact, nobody's heard it because there's only like the editor and myself that have really heard it. But I throw Guadalupe in the intro to the episodes and talk about the coffee because it's super delicious. And so but give, give yourself a, a plug in terms of, you know, whatever you'd like to talk about, how people can subscribe, what what beans they should look at, why they might want to even visit your website, feel free, man. Have at it. All right. So uh, anybody can go visit Guadalupe and um, you can go shopping there for the origins we have available. I always, I drink personally the Nicaraguan because it's very good coffee and it's got the biggest bang for your buck uh, in regards to the social impact. Um, it's helping kids read and 
right in that community. And you can look, see and read about it all there. And if you use the coupon code Derek, um, you get 10% off. There you go. D-E-R-E-K. Well, congratulations again on the farm, on family, on all of the great things in your life, on your contribution to the world and, and your faith. And it has been a lot of fun getting to know you better, getting to hear you express yourself. And uh, man, I'll keep keep drinking my, keep grinding my beans over here from Guadalupe. I love it when the package arrives at my door and uh, it's been, it's been fun, man. Thanks for coming by. All right. Thanks, Derek. A pleasure. See, this is the real secret of life, to be completely engaged with the here and now. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself. <laughs> it was all a dream. Today is about the power of you. You've now entered the Human Derek Podcast. 